in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Rishi Sunak should have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised You're by a special counsel. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> your Parrish. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. We're with you for the next half hour to whistle and chug like a steam tractor at a vintage agricultural fair or something. OK. <laughs> anyway, you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your less than smart speaker today, it seems. Uh, indeed. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, with the thoughts of an agricultural fair in our minds, uh, <laughs> let's uh, trundle on, shall we, through 30 thrilling minutes throttling through the headlines. So here we go. Uh, first up, uh, the Lee Anderson saga continues oh. apace. I know you've got a little bit of skin in this game. Yeah. He is now having refused to apologise for his comments about Sadiq Khan and his Muslim mates. Uh, he's now refusing to apologise, therefore has had the whip removed from him by the Tory party. Uh, Sadiq Khan going around going, he's not an Islamophobic and he's not racist, but I've taken the whip away from him. Why? For not being Islamophobic and not being racist. That's a bit it odd. It does make sense. Anyway, uh, Lee Anderson, and I know you're going to have something to say about this, he has refused to rule out joining Reform UK. Well, that's interesting because I didn't realise we had laid down a red carpet for him, considering he was uh, basically dissing us mere weeks ago. Uh, what I would say is this, you know, I sit back and look at things through the prism of the, the, the border game of politics, as I am wont to do. And what I note is that before the weekend, we had a scenario where Sakir Starmer had taken the speaker into a broom cupboard and said, look, break political convention because we're under threat from Islamists. And it looked really messy because all of a sudden the Labour Party were saying one thing behind closed doors and then in front of camera saying, we've got no problem here, nothing to see here. Anyone who says anything about this is an Islamophobe. And I thought, blimey, Rishi Sunak must be breathing a sigh of relief. Everybody in the red wall is going to think they're rubbish, can't trust them, they're shutting down debate, off we go. And then Lee Anderson appears. And the problem with this is that instead of us being able to have the debate that we were beginning to be able to have at the end of last week, we're just talking about Lee Anderson. It's become the Lee Anderson show. Uh, and politics is bigger than one man. Can I just, uh, can I also say, we're going to have a look at some uh, comments from uh, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. Can I also say the Labour Party still have a massive problem with anti-Semitism. huge. And what worries me about this Islamophobia Tory row is uh, it may be that the Tories have a problem with the Islamophobia. Uh, I don't see it uh, too uh, clearly, but uh, maybe they do. Uh, but uh, just because we're now talking about that, let's not forget mm. that Starmer and the Labour Party have a massive problem with Jew hating. But also, the problem is we're not talking about it, are we? Because all of a sudden, they've done what they always do. The minute we started talking about it, they find their sacrificial lamb, they drag them up to the altar of political correctness and say, there you go, if you say anything from now on, you're also going to be called an Islamophobe. Now, if Lee Anderson had political nous about him. He'd realised what has happened and sort of retreat that. into the wings a little bit and allow us to regain control of this debate. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't think about it at I'm all. Not he, sure just he, said all. It. he just said it. But let's uh, have a look at the Prime Minister talking about uh, the nation's favourite subject right now, and that is Lee Anderson. Lee well, I think the, the most important thing is that the words were wrong. They were ill-judged. They were unacceptable. And that's what I believe. And that's why the whip has been suspended. And I think, I think everyone can see that tensions are already running high. And what I want to do, I think what the country wants to see, is the heat taken out of this debate. And I think that's the right thing to do. And what do you think uh, Keir Starmer thought about uh, Sunak's words? I bet Let's he thinks find Sunak's out right now. <laughs> Let's find out right now. Take it away, sir. Sir Keir. Lego head. I think this is straightforward. It's Islamophobia. And the Prime Minister should call it out for what it is. The reason he won't is because he's so weak. 
Yeah, like you're so strong to, on anti-Semitism. What, really? This is, a, this is Starmer grabbing the mantle, oh, with, embracing it. Shameless. He cannot believe his luck. At the end cannot of last week, Labour were on the floor, dejected yep. MPs walking around the Commons, literally saying, I think we might have blown it here. Uh, all of a sudden, up pops Lee Anderson and uh, Keir Starmer's in control again. Yeah, exactly. And the Tories are tearing themselves into pieces. And like I said, the best thing to do when your political opponents are tearing themselves into pieces is sit back with a big box of popcorn. But the problem I have with all of this is the fact that we're policing language. It's all about policing language rather than policing protests, yeah, yeah. rather than policing extremists, rather than actually dealing with the subject. It's all about what you are and are not allowed to say. Exactly and it's right. just pure Do not let dangerous. these idiots in Westminster, these boys and girls in the Westminster bubble, tell you what you can and cannot say. That's what they disappear up their own backsides about. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't say that, you can't say that, you can't say that. We've got freedom of speech in this country, we can say it. Yeah. I don't think that what Lee Anderson said was racist. I think it was very uh, ill-chosen words, uh, clumsy, yeah. and also uh, factually inaccurate. To, yeah. You know, uh, for all his faults, uh, Sadiq Khan has not packed City Hall with his Muslim mates. Uh, you can say it looks uh, sometimes at the weekend like the streets are handed over to pro-Palestinian marches, but uh, his charges against uh, right. uh, Sadiq Khan do not stack up, and hence his but problem. this is the Let's thing. Let's move on. It uh, might be frustrating in politics that you're not allowed to say what you want to say, or if you say something slightly wrong, you get into trouble. But that's the game, and you've got to know how to play it, which is advice that I would give to Tory MP Paul Scully, because he's been talking about London and Birmingham having no-go zones in, in their Muslim, Muslim areas. areas. Now, now, this again, has been challenged. This has been challenged. says it doesn't... The, these no-go areas uh, don't exist. So, uh, shall we have a listen to Let's Paul Scully? Let's have a Scully? listen. If you look at... Um, parts of Tower Hamlets, for example, where, where people have, there are no-go areas, parts of Birmingham, Spark Hill, but uh, there, there are no-go areas, mainly because of doctrine and mainly because of people um, sort of using, uh, their, abusing in many ways their religion to, uh, to uh, you know, because it's not the doctrine of Islam to, to, to um, espouse some of these, what some of these people are saying. That, I think, is the concern that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I, th I think I think I think you'll find. I'm Alex. more sympathetic he, towards him than Lee Anderson. Yeah, he, well, of course, he he's saying what he believes to be true. Now we're told since his comments that uh, both Birmingham and London, Tower Hamlets, the Muslim areas, say there are no no go areas. Uh, but if that's what Paul Scully believes, then surely he should say it. What we do know is that in Tower Hamlets, they've got a mayor who was done for ballot stuffing, uh, who has some fairly contentious ideas. We also know if we walk through certain parts of London, that it's heavily dominated by a non-integrated culture. Doesn't we mean, know it, that doesn't mean it's other, a no-go it area. It doesn't mean it's a no-go area yeah. because that says something completely different. That is saying that there are people saying you can't come into this street, you can't come down this street or here, there or any or do X, Y, and Z and move about freely without being at risk of some sort of reprisal. Now, I don't think that that is true. And this is that when we present every day, we're all by which Ofcom, do. which we do. Uh, we're all by Ofcom. We, we're not allowed to swear. We do a lot of that during the advert breaks, but we manage to control ourselves for the minutes that we're on air. Do you know why? Because that is the industry that we're in. And politicians, if they want to box clever and represent you, the silenced people, unfortunately, this is how it works. They've got to be smarter than this. Yeah. They've got to be smarter. I mean, if he was right, if he was correct, uh, and there are no, no there are no go areas in both uh, Birmingham and London's Muslim areas, then that's a very serious situation. But Massively we're assured serious. there are not, so he does have to be a bit more careful about yeah. that. But I think I do know what he's talking I about. And once again, about. once again, nothing is served by shutting people down no. by saying you shouldn't have said that, you can't say that, you can't say. Okay, so people will say things that are wrong. Lee Anderson said something. That's we're wrong. human. It looks we're as fallible. if Paul Scully said something. Uh, uh, it looks as if Paul Scully has said yeah. something. He's wrong. actually, um, but don't shut them down. He's on with uh, Julie exactly. Hartley Brewer lately. And, and, so and I think Paul Scully has every right to sort of talk about what he means by this. And I think it's yeah. a very important yeah. conversation yeah. to have. So let's not go doing this whole war of words and games and can't say this, can't say that. But at the same time, if you're a politician, realise that that is the world we live in. So you've got to be and smarter. That's what they think up in uh, Lee Anderson's Red Wall constituents. They think, what are those London idiots no, doing yeah. down there? Uh, debating about what Meanwhile, you can and cannot say, language. Meanwhile, Forget it, while man. we're having a debate about being able to say whether or not Islamic extremism is a threat to the country, uh, millions is going to be spent on giving personal bodyguards to MPs because guess what? <laughs>
<laughs> the thing that you're not allowed to say is probably yeah. true. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it's just mad, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, they're going to, uh, uh, lots of our money, uh, taxpayers' money, is going to be spent protecting MPs. It uh, looks like it's required, it's necessary, but uh, what a pretty pass we've come to. That okay. now we're going to have to pay for the protection of MPs. Already three MPs have 24-7 protection uh, because they seem to be in the firing line. We're hearing things about up in uh, Rochdale uh, where at least one of the candidates apparently is being, his life is being threatened and so on and so forth. What so, is going on? Uh, what the hell is going but, on in this country? You know, and meanwhile, Alex, and still they come. And uh, still they come. This is the migrant crisis like the poor. It is always with us. And it, you, have you noticed it kind of goes away and then it really its ugly head again and guess what uh, more than 2,000 illegal migrants have now arrived on small boats this year and uh, on Sunday one of the busiest days of the year 290 people crossed the channel in five dinghies uh, amid it says amid the warmer weather but actually the weather wasn't very good but it just goes to show Rishi uh, and the government are nowhere near stopping the boats absolutely and do you know what really frustrates me if they had instead of going around glad handing people on the international stage and trying to be polite and go along with some sort of made up global convention that you can't do something and instead had turned the boat around this problem would have been solved if someone from the beginning in the conservative party in government member had said about the pro-Palestine marches when they were shouting jihad and carrying those flags, this is not acceptable, this ends today, we wouldn't be in the situation we have now with an emboldened, emboldened minority giving death threats. Oh, it's just, what? it's the lack of activity, it's the weakness, it's the spinelessness, it mushrooms out of control. This is why people get very angry, this is why tensions go through the roof, because politicians are useless. They should be policing things, not policing language. Absolutely right, uh, Alex, so couldn't agree with you more. Two and uh, Rishi, Rishi Sunak, you know, one thing he could have done, he should have done it six months ago, a year ago, say six months ago, or maybe even today, Start turning the boats round in the middle of the channel, mate, and you might win the election. Just you might win the election. There's a way for you to pull the rabbit out of the hat, but you won't do it because yeah. you want to be in your globalist club. But it's clubs. not just about winning the election. It's about sending a clear message. You don't mess with Britain. Yeah. You can't threaten Britain. You can't come into our country illegally. You can't shout jihad on our streets. It's about protecting the integrity and security of this nation, which is the reason we vote for politicians. It's the reason we have a democracy. And it's, it's their one job. Yeah. They're one job and they're not doing it. There's a feeling. I mean, Rishi Sunak, I think, I think he's just sort of dropped the ball. I mean, everything seems to be falling apart at the seams and he does not seem to be able to get a grip. It gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, that's why his prospects at the next election, I don't think are too bright. Uh, and it's his own fault. Leave the ECHR. Just do it. Uh, right, uh, this is interesting. Or ignore it, yeah. like the French. Yeah, yeah to, like, and the Germans. <laughs> the Everyone else just out. ignores them. We, we treat them like they who must be obeyed. Forget them. Just send, this is not a turn church. the boats around, fly to Rwanda, and tell the ECHR to do one. See what they do about it. They'll do nothing. Exactly. Right, anyway, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, Joe Biden has indicated that uh, a temporary ceasefire, or quite a big ceasefire, 40 day pause in the fighting, is mm. imminent. He expects it by the weekend. Uh, I don't think it's a very good deal for Netanyahu. It's a but rubbish basically, deal. Basically, uh, the agreement would be that, uh, the, that Hamas release 40 of their hostages. They've got about 100. We don't know how many are mm. still alive, but that would not be all of them by any means, probably about half of them. Uh, in return, Israel has promised to, or under this deal, would promise to release 400, 400. Palestinians. Some of them, no. some of them who are in jail for killing Israelis. Right. So now, this if is if Netanyahu <laughs> goes along with this deal, I think a lot of Israelis are going to go, well, what was the last few months about? Right. So this, no, it's interesting, isn't it? It's not interesting, it's almost ludicrous that, yeah, you're right. Like 400 Palestinian prisoners who are people who basically probably committed terrorist offences. Some of them are kill, killed Israelis. Up. Yeah, exactly. That's why they're in prison. Yeah. Uh, they're not exactly in prison just for the sake of it. Remember that these hostages were doing nothing wrong. Most of them were sort of kumbaya singing left-wing lovely people in, you know, their kibbutzes yeah. and at music festivals. Completely the opposite mm -hmm. of prisoners. And yet you're getting one hostage for 10... Uh, prisoners, mm. and this is all due to coincide with Ramadan. You know the the the, the Muslim 
Which of course was when, was when Netanyahu said that Hamas had to sort of capitulate. He said, if you don't give us all the hostages, we will row further on. Uh, but now he seems to be backing down from that, and I don't think that will go down very well with he'll still be called, but anyway, He'll still be called a terrorist anyway, and a genocidal maniac, even by pausing during Ramadan and doing this hostage deal. Anyway, old Joe Biden over in America has been eating an ice cream and telling us all about this possible <laughs> ceasefire. Take it away with you, 99, Joe. Well, I hope by the, the beginning of the weekend, I mean, the end of the weekend. At least my, my, my national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. We're not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. Great visuals, great visuals. Does he think that's a really microphone? good communications department there. Let's that's have a look at Joe. He's always eating. He's always eating. He, he, once uh, he uh, had, there's, a, there's an ice cream there. That's another one of his uh, moments. Uh, there's another ice cream. <laughs> Does he just love? Maybe that's Joe, his problem. Uh, maybe he's actually not. Another ice cream. Maybe he's not got nascent dementia. He's just got permanent brain freeze. Yeah, but he's obsessed with ice creams. What's the matter with him? Uh, I don't think he's the only one who's obsessed with ice creams. Uh, there's uh, someone who. Who works with us? Uh, name of Mike Graham. There he is this morning. They're at the, all eating ice lollies. There they go on uh, talk today this morning with Jeremy Kyle nice. and Rosie Wright, uh, enjoying an ice cream Joe Biden style. Is that a Zoom lolly? One of those yeah, ones shaped like a rocket. It? But it's making his lips I reckon. red. <laughs> <laughs> got oh. on. So there they are. That's what I always do on think breakfast. he would actually make a sort of elegant drag queen, Mike Graham. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> well, I should run that by him later on. I think he, I think he'd make a really lousy drag drag queen, and I say, I say that as a compliment to him. Uh, oh, well, that's put you off your breakfast cereal, hasn't it? Well, that's put <laughs> Sorry. Me off my breakfast ice cream. Uh, what is the matter with him? Why does he keep eating ice cream? Grow up. You're 81. Right, uh, let's talk about uh, policing pro-Palestine marches. They're very much uh, the uh, topic on the table, have been now for a week since they beamed from the river to the sea uh, onto the Houses of Parliament. But policing these marches uh, so far uh, is costing more than £25 million. You know what? I would say no beep, Sherlock. The fact that all of a sudden some Home Office reports this, which has cost us quite a lot of money turning out the entire Met Police to make sure these people don't do tonto things. Uh, that means the police can't do other stuff. You don't say. You don't say that. That's yes, what the general public obvious, have been thinking when they shut down the whole of Tower Bridge. Yeah, duh, where, you know, when every single police officer is taking selfies with someone with a, you know, ISIS flag instead of, you know, doing their job. You don't think the public haven't noticed this? He had to come out of a report and be like, oh, it's costing a bit of money. It's putting unsustainable strain on the police. We know. Yeah, well, look, there's, there's the police not stopping pro-Palestinian marchers blocking Tower Bridge at the weekend. Uh, you know, 25 million, they spent 18 million pounds apparently in uh, December alone. Uh, but uh, I'd like to know what they're doing with this money because I've, I've been to these marches. The cops just stand around looking at them. They don't actually do anything. They don't actually arrest anyone. Uh, so w why does it cost that much money? Oh, the problem we've got, though, is you can't put the genie back in the bottle because this wasn't nipped in the bud. Now, if retrospectively, Parliament has a debate about this. They won't because they'll debate language instead. But if they had a debate about this and went, yeah, language, do you know what? Yeah. Considering we've got to have bodyguards for our MPs, the police are now completely broken because they have to turn out every week to deal with this rabble-rousing mob. Yeah. Um, let's stop the marches. It's too late now. They won't stop. I've seen these couple You can't tell these people to stop now. It's I'll done. Our problem here is uh, the police are pro-Palestine. That is a big problem. Uh, talking of uh, kind of the same issue, Charlotte Church, you like a sing-song, don't you? Uh, so everybody, no, everybody, like get clicking, tap Woo! your toes. Let's have a listen to Charlotte Church singing from the river to the sea. It's a real good tune. Here we go. Take it away, Charlotte. Clarify oh. my intentions there. I am in no way um, anti-Semitic fighting for the liberation of all people. I have a deep heart for all religions. Let's that's remember it. Let's first, have a look at it. Well, no, this one, this, the first clip you saw was actually the follow up single from her new album, uh, which is arguably more tuneful than that first well, one. Well, let's have a listen to that again. 
just to clarify my intentions there, I am in no way um, anti-Semitic, fighting for the liberation of all people. I have a deep heart for all religion and all difference. And, um, and it was a beautiful, beautiful event. But unfortunately, the powers that be um, can't have that can't have um, such a powerful symbol of resistance as, as, as what we um, worked towards on Saturday. And we sang lots of other beautiful songs, lots of other songs of liberation and freedom, Arabic songs, Welsh songs, um, South African songs from the anti-apartheid movement, which were the lyrics which were adapted to the situation in Palestine. Yeah, she's, what she sang, was uh, a genocidal hate song about uh, obliterating uh, the Israeli state, so Israel doesn't exist, and annihilating Jewish people. That's what she sang. Uh, that is not a song of unity, Charlotte, uh, and you are an anti-Semite. Got it? Uh, let's move on. Uh, oh, this is um, sad, isn't it? Yeah. So a British rower has died trying to cross the Atlantic. He was found dead in his boat at sea. What he did is he set off from Gran Canaria. Wanted to. He'd have, the boat is a tiny little contraption with sort of basically paddle power only. Um, he set off from Gran Canaria and uh, four weeks after setting off, well, he is... Uh, been found. Yeah, I mean, this is a very fit 54-year-old, uh, great cause. Uh, he was off to raise money for charity. Michael Holt, 54, uh, he did loads of training, he's Welsh, uh, and uh, said he was ready to do this, well prepared. He was very well prepared. Uh, anyway, he got 700 miles into this epic journey across the uh, Atlantic, which would have taken him from Gran Canaria to Barbados. So uh, it's a, a nearly 3,000-mile journey. So he'd done about a third of it, something like that. And uh, they went off radar, suddenly we couldn't hear him anymore, and uh, they went looking for him, and he was found dead on his boat. Now, he was very, very uh, fit, although he was a type 1 yeah. diabetic, I, I, but he had complained by radio before that that he was suffering severely from seasickness. Uh, and some, and some, pe so some people die of seasickness. He trained for two years, he had medical supplies on board to avoid infections, a spare or, and he was doing this uh, for the charity Mind because a really good friend of yeah. his had committed suicide. Listen, it's just uh, tragic. Uh, yeah, our, our thoughts with his family, of course. Yeah. Uh, now, let's move on. This train driver, uh, you remember this story, got sacked <laughs> yeah. for a tarantula prank. Uh, he put uh, a, a sort of skin of a tarantula and also the skin of a snake, real skins, but not, not the real animals, into the locker of a female colleague. She was mortified. He got sacked for this after 20 years. Uh, he uh, took... Uh, the rail service into a tribunal for wrongful dismissal. Uh, he was employed by West Midlands Trains and he's won. Uh, so he has uh, been restored to his job and he's got £22,500 yeah. compensation. So I mean, it was a practical joke. Can we all just get a grip in this day and age? Do you know, I remember this story because yeah, it was the first cool. week of us doing the show together because we had a debate. Oh, really? We had a debate upstairs on floor 10 about whether people knew the word slough. Oh, that. Do you remember that? Yeah, like a Tarantula snakes and they lose their skin. It's called sloughing, spelt like slough sloughing. near sloughing. Heathrow Airport. Sloughing. We had a debate about that. We Off did. Air. And now anyway. I know that was a word. Now, uh, <laughs> you highlighted this story. Another yeah. day, another, uh, what shall we say, bout of manure spraying in Europe. This time we saw the French farmers descending on Paris, very upset about tariffs, oh, and etc. Now the Belgian farmers have descended on Brussels and the EU per se uh, with their own message of discontent, uh, spraying manure yeah. all over the shop. Well, they've gone uh, absolutely mad. They're lobbing around glass bottles, spraying uh, effluent, they're burning tyres, they're blocking up the, 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 the whole city. This has been happening around Europe. And, of course, the press in the UK don't say anything about it because, oh, no, it's a problem that the EU has. The EU is totally failing and there's huge protests everywhere. We better not mention that. That might make people think Brexit was a good idea. And at the same time, here's another exciting element of how much the EU is failing, the German Bundesbank is about to go bust, as are most of the big central banks around Europe. We're basically on the edge of another massive Eurozone crisis. Europe's going to go bust. It's going to be covered in poo. And uh, we're going <laughs> to sit there and say, yay, we're yeah, 
we're not yeah. in it anymore. Yeah, I blame Brexit. Actually, thank God for Brexit, because we're not involved in this mess. That is Europe self-destructing. Brexit Europe. Uh, it's still The EU is still supposed to be this magnificent Look at it. It's a mess. Uh, body that it's a mess. keeps Europe in good shape. Europe is falling apart at the seams. Thanks to the EU, the club that we left. Now, hey. uh, Patty Blo Boyd uh, was the beautiful uh, blonde of the 1960s who was involved in a love triangle between the Beatle George Harrison, who she was with, and Eric Clapton. What's the famous. a triangle? They were great friends. Eric Clapton started writing letters to her saying, you know, I've formed this thing about you. Do you feel the same? Turned out she did. Uh, anyway, George, Har George Harrison, of course, sadly has died. Uh, but uh, old uh, Eric is still around, and yet Patty is selling all their letters. Now, she's got every right to do that, but it does seem a little bit well, face. What I would say is hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, because apparently her marriage to Eric Clapton then fell apart because of his alcoholism and infidelity, and they divorced in 1989, so clearly she hadn't forgotten well, that. Well, but, um, she's taken a long time to get out. I think this is purely for cash. I feel a bit sorry what? for George Eric. George Harrison was my favourite Beatle. I, I like George a lot. Yeah, I'll have a think about what she was. I think mine was probably Lennon. Uh, oh, but uh, uh, he's now, very woke, though, isn't he? Well, they all bit, were. Yeah, he was a bit of an idiot. But there you go. Uh, Willy Wonka. Now you go to Glasgow. <laughs> you had the Willy Wonka experience. Uh, Thirty-five pounds a ticket. All these kids uh, were promised with their parents. <laughs> you go in there, chocolate fountains. The magic of a marvelous experience. They could go to Brussels. There there it, is, there it is, there it is. Uh, let's have a look at the real let's thing. Let's see. Let's have a look at the real thing, can we? Yes, not quite it? as magical as uh, they expected. Parents were furious. What uh, is it? What is it? <laughs> the Willy Wonka experience. Their kids, the kids apparently only got they got a handful of jelly babies. That's all they got. Look at that. And they got a ca they got a can of bar limeade quid, as 35 well. Thirty-five quid. Parents were so furious, the police had to be called. <laughs> Uh, and the company behind it said, oh, we were let down by a lot of our suppliers. You well, don't you should say. not have opened your doors. You shouldn't then. have done it. You the can't world's just worst that. event. It that reminds me that. of those terrible Christmas fairs, you know, where they have one sheep with some antlers uh, and, you know, a big field, and, that, and that's called we've Winter gone Wonderland. Full, we've gone full circle because I started off talking about a steam tractor at a vintage agricultural fair, and we've well, ended we on go. sheep with yeah, antlers. We ended on Willy Wonka and hey. sheep. Uh, sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of this bit of our show. It's been a bit bonkers hasn't it? Thank you for tuning in. Do join us, of course, at one o'clock. You know what to do. 1pm. Up next is Julia Hartley Brewer. Don't miss it. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia. This is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know,